In the previous lecture, we discussed some of the benefits of designing a multi-account strategy for your various applications and workloads. Now, a multi-account architecture would ensure security isolation, compliance, governance, separation of environments, and ultimately limit the blast radius of potential disasters. While that's all very well, deciding on how many accounts you need and how you're going to centrally manage them is going to be critical in your architectural design patterns. In this lecture, I want to introduce you to AWS Organization, a service that is designed to help you structure your accounts following best practices, enforce security guardrails, and effectively manage costs. AWS Organizations is a management and governance service that enables you to centrally manage multiple AWS accounts for your business. This service lets you bring all of your different AWS accounts under a single organization, a service that allows you to centrally control all of those accounts. The AWS Organization service actually comes with two key feature options. There is the consolidated billing feature, which essentially is a limited version of the organization service. However, the consolidated billing feature allows you to aggregate the costs of the individual AWS account as one bill. I'll talk more a little bit about how this particular feature works shortly. The second option is the all features options, which includes the consolidated billing feature, but also a number of security options to allow you to detect exactly what type of services can be consumed in those AWS accounts, what resources can be created, and what API actions can or cannot be performed. Let's take a look at how the AWS organization service works. So I've got three separate accounts over here, the dev account, the test account, and the production account, potentially for an application that I'm building and looking to deploy shortly. In order to access a specific AWS account, you need to create IAM users. Remember, we explained in the last section of this course that you shouldn't be using the root user for your day-to-day -day operations. I may have a number of dev guys, testers, and server administrators, for example, that have different job functions. And each of these individuals will need their own IAM users in order to log into those accounts. An individual in the organization may also need access to more than one AWS account. And that would mean that you would actually have to create multiple IAM user accounts for that specific individual. Again, a big, huge administrative overhead. Another key point that you need to remember when you create an AWS account is that you need to specify a billing mechanism in the form of a payment method, such as a debit or credit card. And therefore, you would be getting lots of bills to go through at the end of the month. Now, with AWS organizations, things become a lot simpler. In order to set up the AWS organization service, you first need to choose either an existing account that's going to act as what we call the management account or create a brand new account termed the management account. The sole purpose of the management account is to set up the organization service and then ultimately perform consolidated billing and enforce security features. AWS recommends that you actually create this separate management account, and it's important that you do not run any other workload in this management account. Once you've set up a new account to act as the management account, you can configure the organization service with it. Now, I just also want to point out over here that the management account was previously called the master account. So if you're reading through the AWS documentation, you may see some references to the master account. That's the same thing as the management account. Now, in order to make these separate accounts as part of the organization, you need to send out what's called an invitation to those accounts. Essentially, this means that you are inviting those accounts to be part of the organization. The root user, the administrator of those accounts would need to accept that invitation. And once that acceptance has taken place, the organization service converts those individual accounts into what we call member accounts. At this point, the management account has control over those accounts. One of the key benefits of using the AWS organization service, as briefly mentioned earlier, is the consolidated billing feature. One thing that happens when those individual accounts become member accounts is that the management account takes ownership of the charges that will be incurred in those individual accounts. And you end up getting one single bill for all of your AWS accounts. It's still itemized and you're still able to see what charges are incurred in those individual accounts, but it is the management account that becomes responsible for paying the bill. Another key aspect of the consolidated billing feature is that you can benefit from volume discounts. 
AWS charges you on a per usage model. And the more you consume of a particular service, the per item rate for that service reduces. So for example, if you're using storage, the more storage you consume, the per gigabyte rate for your storage actually reduces once it crosses certain thresholds. So if you're using the same storage service across all of those three accounts that you're looking at on the screen, then potentially you can combine the cost of all of that storage across those accounts and get volume discounts. In addition to being able to invite other accounts into the organization, you can actually use the AWS organization service to create brand new accounts. You will be needing to potentially create more accounts in the future, and this is a really easy method to do so. The traditional way of creating an AWS account is to go to the AWS website, set up a new account, and go through the entire process of you know, setting up your contact details, specifying some billing methods, verifying your phone number, and so on. However, once you've set up the AWS organization service, creating new accounts is just a one-click operation. An important feature that I would like to highlight now is also that given the fact that you've set up the AWS organization service, you no longer need to have multiple IAM users for your different AWS accounts and potentially duplicate IAM users for the same individual. Many organizations create a separate account called the Identities account. The idea behind this is that rather than have IAM users spread across multiple different AWS accounts, you consolidate them into one single Identities account. It makes management a lot easier. You may be wondering how those individuals in the Identities account are now going to be able to access the other AWS account in which they need to work in. Now they do this by using something called an IAM role. And I'll talk more about the IAM role in the next section of the course. But in a nutshell, an IAM role is an identity that has permissions attached to it. IAM users from other accounts can be granted the ability to assume that role and the permissions that come with that role allow them to perform the tasks required in the other accounts. This is done through a process called role switching. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we'll discuss more about this in the next section of the course. Large enterprise organizations may also wish to consider using their on-premise identity and access management service to access the AWS cloud. And this is possible through a process known as Identity Federation. Users in the corporate data center can use Identity Federations to log on to the Identities account from which they can assume the roles necessary to access other accounts that they need to work in. Within your AWS organization deployment, you're likely to have many AWS accounts that share a common function or environment. For example, you may have multiple development accounts and multiple production accounts. Now, a really cool management feature is the ability to create organization units, or use that act like containers within which you can club common and related member accounts. You can then apply service control policies, SCPs, which are security policies to these OUs that filter down to the member accounts contained within them. SCPs allow you to define what services can be consumed and which resources can be provisioned. Let's take a look at how this works. Within each organization, you will have one management account. You can then define one or more organization units. An OU can also contain additional OUs within them, what we call nested OUs. And this allows you to further define more restrictive policies for some specific but perhaps related member accounts. Contained within these OUs, you can have one or more member accounts. Next, you can define service control policies that are applied to the individual OUs. And these allow you to define policies and permissions that can filter down into the member accounts. Now, it's also possible to apply an SCP directly to a member account. However, this is not considered best practice due to its additional management overhead. Now, using organization units comes with a vast array of benefits. Firstly, you're able to group accounts based on function using AWS organization units. So you can have your organization units hosting your development accounts and another one hosting production accounts, some hosting sandbox environments, other hosting application workloads, etc., etc. You can therefore apply common policies with service control policies, SCPs. Now we have an entire section coming up on SCPs shortly. 
Now you can also share common resources or use enable you to organize your accounts so that you can easily share centrally managed resources across similar accounts. The AWS Resource Access Manager, RAM, enables you to use or use as a basis for sharing centrally managed resources for your accounts. For example, you can share transit gateways, subnets, AWS license manager configurations, Route 53 resolver rules, and much more. You can also provision and manage common resources so you can deploy common centrally managed resource configurations to groups of related accounts. For example, you can use or use to automatically deploy a set of IAM policies to establish a common baseline security control for a group of related accounts. And finally, you can manage costs and benefit from volume discount using the consolidated billing feature. Now, when it comes to designing organization units, there are certain design principles that you need to follow. And we'll take a look at this next. So you want to make sure that you define your organization unit hierarchy based on security and operational needs. AWS strongly recommends that you consider your OU architecture according to function, compliance requirements, or a common set of controls rather than trying to mirror your organization's reporting hierarchy. Next, you need to consider applying security guardrails to the OUs rather than the accounts themselves. So this allows for better management and governance and ensuring that there is less administrative overhead when compared to if you're trying to apply the OUs directly to the member accounts. Another key design principle that you need to consider when creating your organization unit architecture is to ensure that you avoid deep OU hierarchies. Now you can create a depth of up to five levels of OUs, what we call nested OUs. However, it is just as possible to overcomplicate the OU structure and AWS recommends that you should only add additional levels of OUs if there is sufficient added value. Another key design principle is to start small and expand as needed. The best practice architecture enables you to expand your architecture later, and therefore you shouldn't need to invest a lot of time at the beginning of your cloud adoption journey. Another key design principle is to ensure that you avoid deploying workloads to the organization's management account. Now the management account is designed solely for managing the AWS organization and all of the member accounts. You shouldn't be running any kind of workload in your management account. A key design principle is to separate production from non-production workloads. And the primary reason for this is because ultimately you would be applying different sets of security policies to your production environments versus your non-production environments. You also want to make sure that you limit access to your production environments to only specific individuals and groups of developers who need to work in them. Next, you want to assign a single or a small set of related workloads to each production account. When you create a new AWS account for your production workloads, it is strongly recommended that you assign a single or at the most a small set of related workloads to that production account. Another key design principle is to use federated access to help simplify human access to your AWS account. Now in the next section, we'll be looking at identity and access management, where we'll cover federated access. Finally, you want to use automation in order to support agility and scale. As you increase your consumption of services on AWS, you want to start using tools to help you automate the creation of resources and streamline processes so that you become more efficient. Having automation processes in place will mean that you can rapidly respond to business changes and requirements and reliably provision new environments based on standard configuration. Automation can also help you monitor for compliance and ensure governance. Now, AWS recommends that you provision a multi-account architecture to separate out your workloads and environments, ensure compliance and governance, and limit the blast radius of potential disasters. AWS also offers a set of recommended best practices when it comes to defining your OU structure and a basic group of AWS accounts you need for your cloud journey. The recommended OU architecture is aligned with a well-architected framework, which we'll take a look at later in this course. AWS strongly recommends that you build separate OU architecture for your production and non-production OUs and accounts, and that you use nested OUs to separate out non-production accounts from your production accounts. You should enforce different policy configurations for your non-production OUs versus your prod OUs. And for commercial off-the-shelf products and applications, you should also use separate OUs, one for production and another for staging accounts. Now let's take a look at some of those foundational OUs as recommended by AWS. We'll start off with the 
Security OU. Within the Security OU, we can host multiple nested OUs, one for SDLC, for your dev and test environments, and another for your production environments. AWS recommends that you host a number of different security accounts, including one for log archiving, where you would store CloudTrail logs, VPC flow logs, and config logs. Next, you should consider having one or more security tooling accounts designed to help you perform investigations and detections using tools such as Amazon Detective, Config, and Guard Duty. Other tools to help you enforce data protection like Amazon Macy and infrastructure protection tools like AWS Firewall Manager are ideal for these type of accounts. Yet another account that you should consider hosting are security read-only accounts. In the early stages of investigating any suspected security incident, your security team members first access this account and use read-only IAM cross-account access roles to access other accounts to review and monitor the state of resources. Another security account that you may wish to consider hosting is a security break glass account. Now, this is a special account designed to enable your security team with elevated privileges to access other accounts and fix security issues and handle incidents. Used sparingly and only when authorized through a documented process if there's an incident breakout. Here again, the requirement for a separate break glass account may not be required depending on your architecture. But if you use cross-account access extensively, then a separate account giving you necessary privileges is considered best practice. Next, I'd like to take a look at the Infrastructure Shared Services OU, which is another recommended foundation OU and a set of accounts for your organization. Here again, you should separate out your dev and test environments from your production environments by having separate OUs for those individual accounts. Your Shared Infrastructure OU is designed to share infrastructure services that other accounts in the organization will consume. These could, for instance, include shared VPCs and subnets, directory services and single sign-on services with your on-premises environment, for example, when you're building hybrid cloud solutions, any shared connectivity services like site-to-site -site VPNs, Direct Connect or Transit Gateways, and Route 53 Resolver endpoints for hybrid DNS solutions. Next, let us look at some additional OUs as recommended by AWS. The first OU is the Sandbox OU. Now, this OU is designed to contain accounts that will be used for experimentation efforts, giving your developers a secure and isolated environment to build and design new and innovative solutions. Small teams can be designated with sandbox accounts that have spend limits enforced to ensure overall management while allowing developers the freedom to explore services on AWS. Where necessary, you can also provide developers with administrative access to allow them the freedom to experiment. Another OU recommended by AWS is the Workloads OU. The Workloads OU is designed to host business and end user specific applications. It is vital that you have nested OUs to separate out production accounts from non-production accounts. Often workloads in this OU may contain shared applications or data that are consumed by other workloads in other AWS accounts, and therefore you should implement any necessary cross-account policies as well. Another recommended OU is the Policy Staging OU. This OU is designed to help your security and policy administrators safely test broadly impacting policy changes that are intended to be applied across OUs and accounts. These may be a set of standard policies you wish to implement for an organization, and you need to ensure that they do not have any negative impact on your workloads and applications. An additional OU as recommended by AWS is the Deployments OU. This OU is designed to help support your DevOps principles when it comes to building, validating, and promoting the release and changes of your workloads. Here again, you want to ensure that you have separate OUs for your production and non-production environments for your various CI-CD driven applications. Now, AWS recommends you separate your CI-CD management capabilities from your standard workload environments by using a set of production deployment accounts within the deployments OU. This will ensure fulfillment of critical roles played by a CI-CD processes with necessary policies and permissions that may not be the same as your standard workloads OU. For example, CI-CD jobs usually require write access to publish and promote new release artifacts to your artifacts management system. However, your production workload environments should only require read access to those same artifacts. 
If you're interested in learning more about the AWS recommended OU architecture and design principles, have a visit on that web link shown below at the bottom of the screen, where you'll find deep dive information in how to go about building your own OU architecture for your enterprise organization.